myself Pavishek Ghosh and this is the part 2 of the lecture classification and nomenclature of igneous rocks. So in first part we have covered up to IUGS classification and in this part the topics which will be covered are first how to calculate and plot composition of rocks in triangular diagrams then the procedures of modal calculation then uh, procedure means in brief modal calculation procedures itself will take one separate lecture so in very brief the procedures of modal calculation then how IUGS classification diagrams are made and how to read and then when and how to add prefix names to IUGS nomenclature of igneous rocks and also not violating the norms of nomenclature then how to differentiate between anorthosite, gabbro and diorite in a field as well as under microscope since they all occur as per IUGS diagram in the same place and then classification scheme for phanalytic rocks such as felsic, mafic and ultramafic and this is the conclusion of last video as per the last video who have watched that video they will understand that what was the need of international union of geological sciences to classify the systematics of igneous rocks uh, for a standardized and general classification scheme which will be followed worldwide otherwise which rock is called in Britain as diabase that will be called in India as dolerite so this kind of more than two or three names for a single rock will confuse the students as well as workers that is why the IUGS classification scheme was evolved and now into the main detail the first part calculation and plotting you can see a triangular diagram with x y and z in three apex and the methods of plotting is such this diagram has been taken from uh, in the book an introduction to igneous and metamorphic petrology by john winter and it is like a bible this book even i am giving this lecture or i am preparing this lecture uh, based on that book mainly and then i have added some more information from internet and other books and literatures so this is the basic you can see the x is the top apex of the triangle so the value of x at the top apex of the triangle is 100 and gradual decrease the value of x on the yz baseline of the triangle bottom line of the triangle it has got reduced to zero so first baseline yz is zero then above the dashed line is 10 then 20 then 30 this is the way percentage of x is increasing and in the same way the y the right apex of the triangle at point y the proportion or the amount of y is 100 percent and at the xz line percentage of y is zero so this is the same way that 0 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 90 and then at point y it is 100 so this is the way and for example if we want to plot a rock where there is 70 percent x 20 percent y and 10 percent z is there 
So what we have to do is the 70 percent, 20 percent, and then all. If we add all, then it will give 100 percent. First requisite is this. Otherwise, we have to. If you add x, y, z in such a way, suppose x is 70, y is 10, and z is also 10, then it will add up to 90. So this is if this is not 100, we have to normalize the value. How to normalize? That will be covered later in next slide. But since we have such a condition where 70 plus 20 plus 10 is 100, all sum up. Uh, to 100 we can directly plot this value in the triangular diagram without normalizing it and you can see the point a so how we have plotted the a percentage of x is 100 percent at point x below that dash line horizontal dash line that is 90 below that 80 and below that 70 so it is satisfying that the A point is falling on 70% X and then if we look at the XY line we know on the XY line the value of Z is 0 so the point lying at Z equal to 10% and in the same way at Y equal to 20% so this is the way we plot any rock in a triangular diagram generally we used to have one printout of this chart and then by tracing paper we can easily plot any composition of the rock on the diagram and there are alternative methods also and these methods are uh, far more easy we are taking the same example 70% x 20% y and 10% z and if we see the relative ratio of y and z that is <coughs> calculated by the formula 100 y by y plus z now that is 67% relative percentage is 67 red box appeared this with the relative percentage this is the y and z ratio is 2 is to 1 so we can easily calculate that 67 percent is the y and 33 percent is z if we calculate in within 100 so now we got the position on yz axis and we have to go x is 75 70 percent so by connecting the line of 67 percent and x the apex this two rectangular red box is highlighting the x and the yz ratio on the yz line so on that line somewhere the x 70 percent will be falling because at 0 0.67 67 we are getting what is what should be the uh, percentage of x that is zero and at x point it is 100 so in between that somewhere 70 is lying and since it is a linear scale if we equally divide the x 67 line into 10 halves each half will be amounting 10 percent in this case since 0 to 100 is the range this is the direction of x increment and we can go up to the line where x equal to 70 percent and we can find the position of the rock in the triangular diagram these are the two methods by which we can really calculate uh, or plot any row. So now to next stage.
to classify the rocks using IOGS diagram, these procedures should be used. First is in case of phanetic rocks where also for affinitic rocks but this is mainly applicable for phanetic rocks even in hand specimen or under thin section because affinitic rocks or volcanic rocks sometimes can be very fine grained that so fine grained that it cannot be uh, the mineralogy cannot be determined even under thin section so that is different case and in next lecture that will be covered so as of now the determination of mood that is the percentage of each mineral present based on its volume or area if it if you are calculating in 2d it should be area and if you are calculating in 3d which is very difficult and also theoretical and then it will be called as volume so that mode should be estimated on the basis of cumulative area of each mineral powers in any hand specimen or the thin section under microscope. This is the first step. Now, second step, based on the calculation of mineral percentage on three orthogonal faces, the volume should be estimated. To understand this, uh, if you see any view of rock in plan view or sectional view, Plan view means the view from top to bottom. Suppose you are standing in field or sitting in field looking at any rock. The view you are getting if you are looking just vertically downward that is that will be called a plan view. So or if you are looking at a section which is vertical then it will be called as vertical section. So generally this section or plan, these are 2D, only two dimensions are there. You cannot look through the rock because it is not transparent. So this kind of 2D estimates, 2D, two-dimensional view can give only the area and only two dimensions. Suppose we are getting that, we are seeing that cube, front and back is uh, open in that cube so the yellow plane light yellow plane this is a 2d a two dimensional plane so if we calculate the percentage of each mineral present there then we will get a mineral area not volume but if we calculate or if we cut three sections or, uh, which are mutually perpendicular if we go uh, see in such a way suppose this is one plan view section this is vertical section and this is another section three orthogonal orthogonal means mutually perpendicular if we consider three faces of any rock or if we for a single rock if we cut three petrographic section or thin section Mutually part on mutually perpendicular plane, then and calculate mode for each plane and then normalize it that how much mineral is present in overall area. We can get an idea about the volume occupied by each mineral. So this was the funda for explaining such detail and this way we can get the actual or nearer to actual scenario situation where we can get the volume of or modal percentage of each mineral before plotting on the triangular diagram and the next another question is estimation of areas composed of each mineral on planes parallel to the foliation. Suppose the rock is foliated. In the photograph, you can see the rock which is having a lineation as well as a foliation plane. And this foliation plane 
generally foliation plane you will be knowing later the foliation plane is such where there will be a preferred arrangement or preferred orientation of platy minerals generally the platy minerals are micaceous mineral or needle shaped mineral which are highly anisotrope so that those include that biotite muscovite amphiboles this kind of minerals are platy minerals amphibole is needle shaped actually but still platy sort the long prismatic type this kind of minerals get arranged along the foliation plane so if you the look at any foliation plane suppose for example here the foliation plane is full of biotite and that is why it is not totally black and now suppose the rock is actually granite a foliated granite and you can see the difference a leucocratic rock we are looking at we have to plot that the composition of that leucocratic rock but if we consider the leafage plane or foliation plane for model analysis you are having an idea that whatever you will get you will get the biotite percentage more than the quarzian feldspar and if you plot that due to your wrong judgment of the plane to be considered your whole rock composition will be shifted and based on that if you go if you study further you will get erroneous result because your rock is quarzian feldspathic rock mainly with little biotite but but since you are looking at any foliation plane where biotite proportion is more the decision you will take from the 2d analysis of that foliation plane this rock will fall in very different field so all the quartz feldspar ratio will be reduced and that will be uh, way different from what is actually present in that rock because you are giving too much importance to a foliation plane so that is why this kind of planes for modal analysis will have to be avoided so moving next the next criteria once the volume percentage of each mineral is estimated the following should be written as suppose quartz you are getting that will be in a plane of paper then write q dash the percentage of quartz p dash the percentage of plagioclase and one question is the plagioclase is anorthite 5 to anorthite 100 if you are uh, looking uh, through microscope then you by the angle of symmetrical extinction of lamellar twinning don't get confused or don't get uh, frightened by hearing this kind of lamellar twinning terms because those will be covered in optical properties of plagioclase lecture and that will be covered later so in thin section you can get an idea about what is the composition of plagioclase how much anorthite in last lecture is see the solid solution series ly to anorthite i have explained in a detail so because anorthite 0 to anorthite 5 is actually this composition is actually considered as albite and albite is even considered as alkali feldspar so p dash means what you are considering plagioclase it should be between anorthite 5 and 2 anorthite 100 composition Otherwise, if it is anorthite three percent, then it should be considered as alkali feldspar in A dash, and A dash means alkali feldspar of the place. Then F dash feldspathoids, and calcite, nephilim, this kind of mineral which we will get in silica under saturated rock. Mm, this kind of minerals you will get. Uh, in phonolite kind of rock so uh, that is called feldspathoid this group of minerals 
and they are called as voids and one good thing is quartz and feldspathite cannot occur in a single rock and now the m dash total percentage of mafix accessories and opaque minerals so most of the igneous rocks in the earth surface generally considered greater than 10 percent q plus q dash plus a dash plus p dash means quartz plus alkali feldspar plus plagioclase feldspar or since quartz and feldspathites cannot occur at the same time in equilibrium in any rock they, that is why feldspathites plus alkali feldspar plus plagioclase that is the abbreviation that f dash plus a dash plus p dash and next point is which i have told already and as the u dash plus a dash plus p dash or f dash plus a dash plus p dash is at least 10 percent then we have to ignore the m dash means suppose u dash plus a dash plus p dash that means quartz plus alkali feldspar plus plagioclase feldspar is giving a value of 8 percent 92 percent are mafic in any rock then that rock will be considered as a, an ultramafic rock because in last lecture you, you see that ultramafic rock by definition is greater than 90 percent mafic minerals so in that case the classification scheme have to be followed in a different way but suppose in general the most of the rocks have at least 10 percent of quartz plus alkali feldspar plus plagioclase feldspar so then in that case we have to ignore the m part m dash means mapping mineral percentage suppose you are getting q dash plus a dash plus p dash as 11 percent and mapping is 89 percent then also you have to ignore all the mafic and you have to normalize the remaining three parameter to 100 and how to do it it is just an unitary method suppose uh, total quartz plus alkali feldspar plus plagioclase feldspar is 20 and quartz is 10 percent then out of 20 quartz is 10 so 100 it will be 50 so just by multiplying each by 100 by the sum of quartz plus alkali feldspar plus plus feldspar this is the formula the same formula you can arrive on your own there is no point of cramming it next from this we get the normalized q value and as well as a p and f value the normalized values and the actual values the difference of abbreviation is normalized value will be written as q and actual value will be written as q dash so this notation you have to remember and now what i have told that it may seem strange to ignore the mafix but still it is the procedure you can't do anything as a result a rock with 88 percent mafix can have the same name a rock with 2% mafix with the QAP ratio Q is to A is to P is quartz is to alkali feldspar is to plagioclase feldspar the ratio remains same in both the rocks but there are also ways of differentiating by adding prefix will come later and now we have to determine whether the rock is phanetic or plutonic or affinitic or volcanic Based on that, different classification schemes should be utilized. Now, then, based on the relative proportion of normalized Q plus A plus P or F plus A plus P, we have to plot the rock in IOGS diamond. That's why it is called IOGS diamond and tell it And by any of the explained methods of calculation and plotting. I have covered in third and fourth slide 
and if the rock is phanetic and q plus a plus b or q f plus a plus b is less than 10 then we have to use IVGS triangles for mapping and ultramafic rocks so this is the IVGS diamond it is diamond because it is just like the two triangles with a mirror plane in, along AP line that is why it is similar to a diamond shape and the brown part is UAP that is for silica saturated rocks silica over saturated rocks and the FAP triangle is for silica under saturated so this is the way now we have to know that how this diagram has been found based on which principle so that is why in left one QAP triangle we have created you can see the values 5, 20, 60 and 90 along QP line the quartz percentage is 90 along the topmost horizontal dash line 60 along the red line 20 along the blue line and 5 along the dark red line so this is the way the diagram QAP you can see in the same way there are four fields divided not four actually five fields the top part above 90 percent quartz line if any rock for the composition falling in within that will be called quartzolite any composition falling within the quartz 60 to quartz 90 line that is called that will be called quartz rich granitoid now comes further complexity in ap baseline QFP triangle, there are four points that is alkali feldspar 90 or plagioclase 10, the leftmost, then alkali feldspar 65 or plagioclase 35, then alkali feldspar 35 or plagioclase 65, and then finally alkali feldspar 10 or plagioclase 90. So these are the field, the line of 20% quartz and 60% quartz has basically four fields and the base of that is classification is along the AP line 10, 35, 65 and 90. These points are important. And from that point, you have to connect the Q point. It cannot be parallel to the triangle lines. It has to be like radial connection of 10 and Q, 35 and Q, 65 and Q, or 90 and Q. This is the way the fields are divided. And this is the way the QAP or FAP or UAFP IUGS diamond have been formed. On the left side, where alkali feldspar is greater than 90%, plagioclase feldspar is less than 20%, and quartz is to within 20 to 60%. That field, any rock falling in that field will be called alkali feldspar granite. In the same way you can see granite, granodiorite, tonalite all will be plotted with all fields drawn. Now for example suppose a analytic rock, igneous rock which is having 18% quartz, 32% plagioclase, 27% orthoclase and 12% biotite, biotite is mapping. 8% horn blend, it is also mapping, and 3% opex and accessories present. 
on this for calculation or plotting we can get that u dash plus p dash plus a dash is 27 percent and since 77 percent means it is greater than 10 percent then we have to ignore the mapping percentage the remaining 12 plus 8 plus 3 23 mapping percentage we have to ignore and we have to normalize now so for normalizing we have to multiply the u dash p dash and a dash value by 100 by 27 and this is the way we are getting that q is 23.38 means 23 approximately 41.56 since it is above 41.5 we can consider that 42 and a is 35.06% so how to plot it the alternative method is the q p and a normalized to determine which field the rock plots we have to determine and on the ap line baseline of the qap triangle and on the ap line what is the relative percentage of <coughs> plagioclase and alkali feldspar so this is the plagioclase 55 and alkali feldspar 45 this is the division so this is the red point here from ap axis and that is falling in between 35 to 65 values and in all case you don't have to be very perfect you have to just check what is the field where it is falling for that this kind of quick approximation studies will also help that it is somewhere lying between 35 and 65 the midpoint is 50 so 55 is this and now along the line connecting q and that composition p equal to 55 and a equal to 45 we have to connect a line and since q is normalized towards is 23 we have to go up to 23 along that line since it is crossing the 20 large line it is falling in the granitic field so this rock can be called as granite as per IUGS classification that is all this is the way we plot a rock is one example now few questions before naming please don't use the term poet in a rock name this poet is a common name for fields effort. There are many kinds of poet, those nephilim, calcite, this kind of rocks. So what is poet cyanide? Suppose you are getting that fields pathoid which is present in the rock is nephilim, you are sure, then don't and the rock is falling in the cyanide field of FAP diagram, then you better call it as nephilim cyanide instead of calling it as white cyanide the same is for alkali feldspar granite or alkali feldspar quartz cyanide or alkali feldspar cyanide field use the true feldspar name if you can determine it suppose you know that the present alkali feldspar is orthoclase then you better call it orthoclase granite or orthoclase quartz cyanide or orthoclase cyanide now moving next for rocks not near p this is one serious problem you can see on the right bottom part of the qap diagram where the <coughs> Quad is 0 to 5 percent and plagioclase is 90 to 100 percent. Plagioclase is 0 to 10 percent. In that field, you can see the diorite, gap rope, and orthosite all are falling, but they are quite different rock. 
the upload diodite and the anode side they plot in a single field but they are totally different so anode side is a rock where 90 percent or more plagioclase is present so while getting the modal analysis on that percentage of plagioclase which is unusually high than other rocks you can determine that okay since it is having greater than 90 percent plagioclase it is anorthoside it cannot be diorite or gap though it is falling in the same field of diorite and gap too but suppose you are getting plagioclase value which is usual and how could you determine then it is not anorthoside but how do you determine that what, whether it is diorite or whether it is gap in hand specimen gap has greater than 35 percent matrix whereas diorite has less than 35 percent matrix and the horn blend plus minus pyroxide so in that case the percentage of mafic and specimen can act as a guide whether it for differentiating between diorite and gabbro and even you cannot determine it in field or not sure and the thin section gabbro has a plagioclase with composition greater than anorthite 50 while diorite has a plagioclase composition Anorthite uh, less than anorthite means L white oligoclase and this and labradorite, bitonite, anorthite, these minerals or these solid solution series will be present in gap group. But less than anorthite 50, you can check the last video where I have explained in detail. Uh, plagioclase solid solution series so from that by in section analysis you can get an idea whether it is diorite or gabbro even if you are not sure in the field though the hand specimen method is not recommended by IUGS still since calcic plagioclase greater than anorthite 50 is dark or mafic in color or appearance so the appearance of gap blue since it is it contains more the plagioclase which is by composition more than 50 percent anorthitic so gap blue will look as a melanocritic or mafic since sodic plagioclase is present in diorite it will have a Salt and with pepper or black and white texture. This is how the problem of diorite, gabbro, or anorthosite will be solved. Moving next, the modification of IUGS term. If adding any mineralogical, textural, or chemical feature or chemical name to the IUGS name of any igneous rock helps to add more accurate descriptive information to it then it is acceptable under the IUGS system for example the granite with unusually light colored can be called as leucogranite or unusually dark colored granite can be called as melagranite and the problem 88% mafix with QAP ratio same with any rock where mafics are present in 2% they will fall in the same field but this kind of addition of mela or leuco prefix can easily demarcate the difference and still you can use IOGS classification Besides the mineralogical or mafic leuco meso, this kind of prefix, you can also add textural terms such as porphyritic granite, or granite, or graphic granite, 
what we did now you got introduced in the first lecture about lefaxby and copy these two texture will be covered in later lectures because texture will take several lectures to discuss in detail names such as pegmatite applied and tooth are basically incomplete name because pegmatite means a uh, very coarse grained rock but applied is fine grained granitic rock tooth is mental pyroclastic rock so rather we should use the structural term to modify the rock name as in pegmatitic orthoclase granite means in which rock you are seeing the pegmatite in a tonalite or in a orthoclase granite then just add as prefix name pegmatitic orthoclase granite or apolitic granite or rhyolitic tooth in this way you can use this kind of textural terms and some important mineralogical information may also be conveyed such as name uh, rebeckite granite or muscovite biotite granite get get confused by the name of rebeckite it is a sodium rich amphibole only amphibole it is very rare but in some a type granite again you will get uh, getting confused that uh, after hearing that a type granite i will discuss later so this kind of specific unusual presence of any mineral can signify any granite or any rock this kind of specific minerals can be used as prefix before iugs name and the order of name suppose muscovite biotite granite if more than one significant unusual mineral is present in granite name then the names are listed in the order of increasing modal concentration means in the muscovite biotite granite the biotite is present in more proportion than muscovite that is why less lesser common minerals will be at first and more common minerals will be at second there is a technique of using prefix and at times chemical modifiers such as alkaline calc alkaline or aluminous also can be used during nomenclature for example alkali granite means there is a scope for formation of alkali amphiboles sodic amphibole or ribeckite or alkali pyroxenes which are sodic pyroxene in granite so rare situations can be described by this style of nomenclature easily going next this is the iugs triangle for gabbroic rocks or mafic rocks and several triangular diagrams can be used to explain these are the rocks where plagioclase is more than 90% we already discussed that is anorth anorthosite on the topmost of the leftmost color triangle and gabbro any rock falling between the plagioclase pyroxene axis where olivine is less than 5% that will be called gabbro or plagi and plagioclase is more than 5% any any rock where plagioclase is less than 5% with any amount of olivine and pyroxene it can be considered as ultramafic rocks and troctolite is a peculiar name or rock that is olivine plus plagioclase where pyroxene is less than 5% that olivine and plagioclase rich rock mafic rock is called troctolite and within that the olivine gabbro field the left diagram 
can see a fast distance is there anything which will be plotted within that field will be called olive in diablo and there are conventions of using leuco and mela terms in gabbro also based on the relative proportion of plagioclase the gabbro where plagioclase is more than 65% up to 90% will be called because of the presence of more plagioclase that rock can be called as leuco gabbro means that is unusually light colored the normal gabbro that is leuco gabbro and where plagioclase is 10 to 35% then it will be called as mela gabbro and in field it is very difficult to differentiate between orthopyroxine and clinopyroxine but on the thin section it can be differentiated since plagioclase and opx orthopyroxine bearing rock will be called where cpx means clinopyroxine will be less than 5% or plagioclase and OPX that is plagioclase and OPX reach row it can be called as norite and plagioclase plus CPX this kind of row will be called as normal gap this is about the classification of mafic or gaproic rocks and where conblend is present Plagioclase, the rightmost top triangle that plagioclase, the apex and in left apex it is pyroxene and right apex it is hornblende. The presence of hornblende sometimes create difficulties in classification that will be covered in next slide. Now the classification of ultramafic rocks. Generally in ultramafic rocks plagioclase is less than 5%. So the dominating phases are olivine, orthopyroxine and clinopyroxine. So the line which is dividing the diagram into two halves is olivine 40% line. Any rock falling below Olivine 40% line or any rock which contains less than 40% olivine will be classified as pyroxenite and any rock, any ultramafic rock which contains more than 40% olivine along with orthopyroxine, linopyroxine of any percentage will be called as peridotite. In peridotite, where olivine monominal relic rock is present that will be called as dunite then three types of rock can be classified when the olivine content of that rock ultramafic rock will be lying between 40% and 90% or remembering in a better way that Hertzburgite, Lerjolite and Werlite or remembering or writing in exam it is better to follow alphabetical terms. You won't forget that Hertzburgite, Lerjolite, and Werlite name because they are uncommon actually. But you can see the first letter H, L, and W in alphabetical order from left to right. So this is the easiest way to remember. Otherwise, Werlite and Hertzburgite will be reversed and you will get no marks. Yeah. By doing such mistake, so Hertzburgite means olivine plus OPX to pyroxene rich rock. Lerjolite means is they are basically mantle rocks, peridotites, Hertzburgite or Werlite, and Lerjolite where olivine, orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene all will be present, and Werlite where orthopyroxene will be less than 5%, and it is olivine plus clinopyroxene rich rock. So these are about the peridotites, one is dunite, mineralic you know, olivine rock, and then olivine plus orthopyroxine rich rock, hardwoodite, 
olivine orthopyroxine plus clinopyroxine free each rock that is levulite and olivine plus clinopyroxine free each rock that is oelite. Now the pyroxenite parts. The rocks, ultramafic rocks, in which olivine is less than 40%. The clinopyroxine and orthopyroxine present in same proportion and olivine is less than 5% that will be called websterite. The monominalic orthopyroxine rich rock will be called orthopyroxenite, very easy to remember. And monominalic clinopyroxine rich rock will be called as clinopyroxenite. <coughs> the rock where clinopyroxine is five per, less than 5% and olivine is less than 40% and rest is orthopyroxine will be called as olivine orthopyroxenite. The ultramafic rock or pyroxenite where olivine is less than 40% but above 5% will be called olivine websterite or the ultramafic rock where orthopyroxine is less than 5% and olivine is between 5 to 40% and rest is clinopyroxine dominated will be called as olivine clinopyroxine now again the presence of more than 5% blend in any mafic or ultramafic rock can create problem in nomenclature. Now this is one simplified diagram in a single cell what I have explained in last two slides this is the mafic rock part and this triangle below represents <coughs> ultramafic rocks. These two diagrams have been discussed in detail in the last two slides. So now we are moving towards the unblend problem. Since in a rock unblend may be present in amount greater than 5%. When to call it a hornblendite and when to call it a pyroxenite, that is a problem. To explain that problem, we are taking this diagram, olivine, pyroxene and hornblende from three apexes. In this field, where hornblende is more, You can see the horn blend is more and four underlines red underlines olivine pyroxene horn blend light at seven the field which is marked by seven number is olivine pyroxene horn blend light <coughs> because here olivine is between five to forty percent pyroxene is between five to fifty percent Field number 8, that is olivine hornblende light. Here, pyroxene is less than 5%. Olivine is between 5 to 40%, that is why it is olivine hornblende light. This whole field 7, 8, 11, and 12 will be given a name hornblende light. Only based on the proportion here, 11 will be called as because here olivine is less than 5%, so there is no scope of naming it as olivine prefix it will be pyroxene hornblendite and to at 12 both olivine and pyroxene both are below 10 percent and hornblende is more than 90 percent so it is pure hornblendite just in the left part this pyroxenite blue dash rectangle is representing the pyroxenite part and in the same way the number 6 rock will be called as olivine hornblende pyroxenite number 5 will be called olivine pyroxenite number 10 will be called hornblende pyroxenite and number 9 will be called only pyroxenite so this is the way we can differentiate between hornblendite and pyroxenite if blend is present in proportion above 5%. So 
this is all about the IOGS classification of granitic rocks and mafic and ultra rocks. Next video classification of affinity rocks and pyroclastic rocks with one generalized approach towards classifying the rocks field and under thin section will be covered for that for now thank you thank you for your patience here